if we're rolling. Well, I want to start out with any questions. Okay. So let's start out with a question I have over here to my right. How do we know this equation is wrong? Uh, it's zero over one. How do you get zero? One over one, I guess. Because you can reduce pretty much everything there. All right, how do you reduce to zero, though? Well, I made a mistake. It would be one over one in the end. How are you getting one on top? Think that when you're reducing an equation, you always imagine an imaginary one up there. All right, so that this FP would be uh, sim civiliz this is a simulation civilization simulation civilization capable of civilizations. That's a mouthful. Uh, simulation civiliz civilizations that can create. A simulation, that's what this is, where ultimately, given slightly more context, uh, this was an argument by a philosophy professor that we are currently living in a simulation. And this was the equation he used in the published paper. So this would be number of civilizations that are capable of doing it divided by the total number of civilizations. Fi, the fraction of those, sim, those civilizations, the sensitive capable who actually have an interest to run a simulation, and then average number of civilizations simulated. So if I multiply those together, why would I get one? So everything cancels out except for the plus one at the bottom, right? Oh, as in FP cancels with FP? Uh, no, that doesn't work that way. If I did 2 over 2 plus 4, um, that's not 1 fourth, it's 1 third. You have to do this before you can do the division. So. If we were to look, I'm trying to remember my convergence things. If we're to basically replace all the variables with infinity, we're going to converge to zero, aren't we? Ah, uh, if any of them shoot off to infinity, uh, there's still another problem there. Okay. It, it's not an issue of that. So let's say total number of people ever a uh, hundred. Just let's say it's a hundred. At which point, fifty are living in the simulation. Uh, actually, we'll end up with that. So let's just take that out for a moment. We'll do the others. Fraction of the civil, civ civil capable civilizations. So let's say that there are a hundred civilizations total, of which. Half of them are capable of creating 
a simulation, uh, an alternate reality. Fraction of sim sieve with interest to run. So this would be of the 50, there are, let's say, five of them, just to make the math simple. And then each one of those on average runs three. Because it's not math class, we probably should have something else. What am I missing there with those numbers? The variables? No, these would, I guess, be considered the variables here. You place with the number sum to come out with a, a number that supports what he wanted to do. The values? Well, the values right there. So this is the, there's 50 sim, civ, capable civilizations, so S, triple C, uh, total number of civilizations, so let's do 100 civilizations. This would be five interested civilizations over 50 SCCC, and this is the number of simulations. What would the units of the denominator of uh, the numerator be? Uh, it would be SCC, well, 50 SCC, and then Drop back, so perhaps it's a bit too abstract at the moment. So if you multiply that out, what would it end up being? Three uh, x over two. I have to do your y's. I heard somebody say it. Cancel? Yeah. The y's are going to be canceled. The units work the exact same way. So if I multiply SCCC over C times the units of that one, which is IC over SCCC, times units here, which is simulations, I guess per. Interested in civilization. What will my units end up being? Sim over C? Yeah. Alright, so that this is the exact same thing as up there. So it would have the same units, and then I add one. What's wrong with that? Exactly. Just by looking at the units, this equation cannot work. For some bizarre reason, it got published in a scholarly journal. Not a what, it was a philosophy journal. But no one looked at it from that point of view. They published a correction 10 years later, as somebody pointed it out. Now, the premise to come up with his even the modified equation or this equation, I think was incredibly flawed, but he was trying to make the argument that we're living in a simulation right now, or that probability is we are living in a simulation right now. Just a little bit of dimensional analysis would have saved us from that piece of crap. Anyway, a little bit of editorializing there as well. But the main, main thing here is that units matter, 
And you can sometimes, if you're not sure of an equation, take a look at the units and see if you come out with what you want it to. Uh, I started to, started to take a glance there. How many of you, and then promptly forgot, how many of you have had physics before? So it's like two and a half. Okay. There's an equation. Uh, let's go for something a little bit more visible. S is a, well, actually let's do it right. Delta S is a, what's called displacement. It's where are you relative to where you started. Let's assume it's a one-dimensional problem. But all I'm looking at is units here. If I'm looking at how far away am I from where I started, what would the units be? Meters. Say again? It's the length of some sort. Yeah. So did you say meters to start with? Or did you just say length? I just said length. Okay. Uh, let's do it that way then. All right, so we've got a length. This is a velocity, so the units would have to be the same as speed. So what would the units be? All right, so which is a length over time, times time, which has units of time. I know that might be a shock, but it's a true story. Uh, one half is unitless. Acceleration deals with the change in velocity over change in time. We'll put it in the calculus version later, but just leave it like that for now. So what would the units of acceleration be? What are the units of velocity? Meters. And length over time. Uh, uh, length over time. So that's a length over time. Over and the units of time? Uh, yeah. As radical as an idea that is. So that would become some length over time squared. So that's length over time squared times time squared. So notice that what happens here is that the units of time cancel out here, the units of time squared cancel out there. What I'm left with is a length plus a length. If I do a length plus a length and get a length, does that make any sense? Yep. I hope so. If for some reason you left that square off, as some students are wont to do, uh, we would end up with length here plus length over time, and hopefully you would recognize as something's gone wrong. If you're ever doing any complex derivation where you're just dealing with letters, occasionally I find it helpful for me to just take a moment, plug units in, see if it makes sense still, and if it doesn't, figure out where I made a mistake. Questions on the glory that is units here before I erase. Is correct. I made a mistake. Now, how can you do it? You multiply by 100. Why by 100? Because 100 centimeters are a meter. Okay. So you're saying that this is 500 cubic centimeters? No. It, yeah. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. Wouldn't you need square to 100? Or cube to 100? Why? It's 
meters cubed. It is meters cubed, but why would you multiply by 100 three times? Because in every dimension, it's going to the next power. Say that again? In every dimension, it goes to the next power. So if you're doing meters to centimeters, it'd be 100 so on and so forth. Okay, I, I think the spirit of what you're saying is right. The, the wording still seems a little bit off to me, but so basically I've got three units I need, to, I need to convert. I have three different meters because meters cubed is the same as meters times meters times meters, and I have to, for each one of these, I have to convert it. So we're talking five million cubic centimeters, or five million milliliters. By the way, in cubic meters, what is my volume, approximately? Just to get some sort of sense. What is my volume? All right, I want you to think of a number in cubic meters. And so a meter, oh, there we go, there's a meter thing. So that's one meter. So imagine that I've got a cube. Uh, so one meter going that way puts me to about here. And then one meter up, and then one meter out. If I were puree, how many of me would fit inside a one cubic? Or how many of me, or what would be my volume? Maybe half a cubic meter. Anyone else? If I, what is my volume? If I were, well, actually, it doesn't matter if I'm pureed or not. Uh, approximately, what is my volume in cubic meters? So far, we've got a 6 more people come on All right first off let me state that everyone in here is going to be wrong at some point If you're afraid of being wrong in front of other people it'd be really helpful if you just get over that quickly You're going to be wrong in front of someone else at some point It's okay to be wrong Two Fifth one point five, another point five, and it seems like five. Five? How big do you think I am? <laughs> and potentially we'll do the calculation later on, but just to have some sense, my volume is about point one cubic meters. So ah, should have given you an opportunity to take bets, but oh well, next time. So, I weigh about 220 pounds, so uh, that would put me at 440 pounds. I wouldn't fit through the door on that. How did you figure that? Did you like jump into a tank with markers on it or something? I did it, did it two ways. One, I actually did body parts, so I got you know, like five cylinders right there, I got a disc here. Oh, I went through and it broke my body part into common shapes and then did average measurements. Uh, the other way of doing it is I know my density is about that of water. Right. So if I know what my weight is, then I know the difference between my floating and not floating is you know, a month full of air, I'm gonna float. If I exhale, I'm gonna sink. So therefore, what would the volume of water be 
that would have the same weight. So two ways, and they actually came out with pretty darn close answers. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been talking about one of the methods. All right, questions to here. Now, some of this, obviously, I just I went through very rapidly, but I at least wanted to hit some basics. And the, the last little basic I want to hit before we actually get into physics or math, it depends on how you want to look at it, is this. I have a unit circle. I have a line here, some angle of theta from the positive horizontal. It's going to hit the circle at this point right here. What is this distance? in terms of trig functions. Cosine. Is there a question mark at the end? No. Cosine, just give me the whole full thing. How do you mean cosine theta? There we go. All right, so this is cosine of theta. That distance? Sine theta. Now, you draw a tangent line here where at the point where it hits, uh, what would this be? Tangent. That length? Also tangent? No. no. Uh, because I drew my about a 45 degree angle there, it, they look a lot alike. But... Arctan? No. That was a question. Arctan will give you an angle. All right, we'll come back to it. Uh, this length right here, from here to where the, the tangent line hits the, we'll call it x-axis for lack of a better name at the moment. Recognize that the larger this angle is, the smaller the cosine value will be, and then the larger this value will be. So this will get larger as theta gets closer to 90 degrees. Yep, that's the secant. 